Irish Media Network. We entertain. Hey, how are you doing, everybody? Welcome to the Cannabis Review Show. I'm your host, Patrick McCartan. Um, I hope you're all doing very, very well. We're coming to you from a sunny California, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the epicenter of the global cannabis industry. Uh, again, the purpose of this show is to give you insights into the various different aspects of the industry, from cultivation to manufacturing to the to the brands to the the investment world, um, and also bringing in the social impact too. So um, uh, today's uh, session, we're going to be uh, interviewing uh, a very very respected gentleman, uh, Deepak Anand uh, from Materia. A little bit about Deepak, he's uh, recognized as a thought leader in the global cannabis space. He currently serves as the co-founder and CEO of Materia Ventures, which is a European focused supply and distribution company for medical cannabis and CBD products. He previously serves as a VP of business development and government relations at Cannabis Compliant Inc., as well as VP of Canadian licensed producer Zenibus. He is a board member for several for and not profit, not for profit cannabis businesses and industry associations across North America and Europe. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Deepak. How are you, Deepak? Good, Patrick. Thanks for having me. For sure. Where are you located today, Deepak? Vancouver, BC. And unfortunately, ah, it's sunny. Not too sunny, yeah. Well, we'll take care of that over here on, on our side. Deepak, tell us a little bit about your 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 journey into the cannabis industry, because I know you've been very prevalent in the Canadian particularly in the Canadian, the growth of the Canadian um, market there, and obviously the European too. But tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you got into cannabis and what, what brought you in. Yeah, so uh, Patrick, I was uh, in the pharmaceutical industry prior to coming to cannabis. And, uh, you know, it was very just mainstream, uh, you know, pretty boring in terms of uh, just what you were doing from a social responsibility cause. It was, you know, you were, you were getting patients their medicine, but it wasn't really... Uh, truly satisfying. I mean, the cannabis industry, my first foray was through a not for profit where I was basically uh, assisting, uh, you know, the, the entire value chain. So, you know, patients, physicians, uh, government, as well as producers, and really uh, helping people figure out the cannabis, uh, you know, industry and kind of what building that looks like. And this was going back seven years now in Canada when we first started creating our medical cannabis program. And so, you know, it's been truly, uh, you know, heartwarming and, and satisfying really in terms of uh, seeing this industry evolve, uh, particularly the way that our government's gone about legalizing it. Uh, you know, in 2018, we became the first G7 country to legalize cannabis. So uh, it's been a very personally satisfying journey uh, as we've gone through this process. For sure. And tell us a little bit more about Materia Ventures and, and what the purpose of is of Materia is. Yeah, so we're, a, a, you know, a European focused uh, manufacturing distribution business on both medical cannabis and CBD products. Uh, we, the way that we looked at the European market was that it was fairly fragmented, uh, you know, not a lot of sophistication as it relates to brands or even products. And so, uh, you know, what what we're doing is basically addressing uh, on one side the, the, the vacuum, which is just basically a product vacuum in terms of different types of products and different cannabinoid contents. And on the other side, having a sophisticated compliant product that that, uh, is regulated and you know bringing that sort of maturity to the European market. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we think about corporate social responsibility and the impact that cannabis can have on 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 health and wellness, it's 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 not been a real topic of conversation. Sustainability and corporate social responsibility has not really been um, sort of to the fore of the industry. Um, most of the industry has been considered a, a gold rush and a sort of a get quick rich overnight. Um, what, what, where do you see risk corporate social responsibility and the, and the whole sustainability arena in the industry going forward? Because I know we've, we've, we're particularly Canadian investors and, and Canadian LPs have lost a lot of equity and, and lost a lot of value in their companies, um, particularly after the crash about a year and a half ago. But where do you see things going for the future for, for the industry as it starts to grow up and starts to mature? 
Yeah, look, I mean, you know, what's happening right now, and I think COVID has arguably just expedited this pay train, which is on the one side, you know, you've got a number of companies that were, uh, didn't really have a business plan, were going to, you know, fall by the wayside, were maybe going to make it, weren't going to make it. I think COVID's expedited that process. And so now you're seeing separation of uh, not only companies, but also individuals within companies and seeing who's here for the long term versus who was here to make a quick buck, right? Whether it be some of the bigger CEOs that are now and the founders that are now moved away. And, you know, there's arguably a number of reasons why they've moved away. But nonetheless, I think if you look at the industry today, it's people that are here to stay for the long term. Uh, arguably, most of them, you know, will be here for the long term. I think if you'll still see a few more, at least the Canadian cannabis industry is going to see a few more uh, carnages occur. And there's going to be a few more people that actually move out of the industry. But I, uh, quite frankly, felt feel like that needs to happen. Uh, I think the CSR piece that you brought up is, you know, exceptionally important. I think there is still so much work to be done, whether it relates to people of color, uh, particularly, you know, at the current moment and everything that we're going through. I think there's just so much work that still needs to be done on, on CSR from every aspect of the industry, uh, whether it be patients not being able to, you know, still access cannabis for medical purposes, whether it be retail uh, storefronts, whether it be international markets opening up. I mean, we've made a lot of progress, but there's still very much that needs to happen. And CSR is, you know, is always an evolving aspect, and but we're far from from done, there's still very much that needs to be done on that forte. And we're quite excited actually to be working on that and, and contributing as best we can from a material perspective. Yeah, for sure. And and what I've noticed in the industry over the past few years is just really sustainability, ethics, responsibility, doing the right thing, leveraging business as a force for good has been has been missing in many ways from a lot of the companies as, as everybody's kind of focused on the, the quick win. But I think now that we've had the crash and with COVID, it's really brought to light the the the, the role that cannabis is playing. Um, it being considered a a um, um, an important part of society here, particularly here in the states where we're based in California and many other states, uh, it's considered an essential service. Um, is is that is it? How is it considered uh, in in Canada? And, and just using Canada as, as a case study for the moment, um, it's you know it's been elevated to the essential service. Um, category over here. What's it like in, in Canada during uh, the, this pandemic? Same thing, Patrick. I mean, it's 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 classified as an essential service, uh, and not only medical, even even adult use or recreational. Uh, we saw a number of the provincial governments come out and and basically, uh, you know, at, at first say, well, maybe it's not an essential service, and you know, almost eight or nine days later, say, no, no, hold on a second, it is an essential service. Right. Whilst we saw some shutdowns, at least in a couple of provinces earlier, uh, the government very quickly and swiftly changed that because they just saw that that not only were they going to lose up, they were going to throw this industry back into uh, sort of the illicit market if they hadn't actually started to make those changes. So very much the same as you're seeing in California and elsewhere in the US, Patrick, where uh, we're seeing the same thing here. And I think it's actually quite, you know, it's a global theme. I mean, you look at Amsterdam as an example, cafes were lined up uh, in the initial days of COVID. And so, you know, I think globally, we've seen cannabis go from sort of something that was barred and prosecuted to being uh, an essential service. It's actually pretty cool when you look back and, and watch, but Canada is the is very much the same. Yeah, for sure. It's a super, it's a super cool concept. And um, it's really elevated, as I mentioned, it's really elevated the industry to a, a newer level. And and it's also, it's 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 breaking down barriers for people that may not necessarily understand what this is all about. They may consider it as something that's a, a, you know, a taboo topic, but um, as people start to understand and learn more, which is part of what we're trying to do as an, as, as an industry is to educate those that don't understand the value of cannabis, particularly as a, as a medical um, uh, option other than as opposed to opioids, for example. Uh, a lot of our readers are, and our, our, our listeners are, are based in Ireland. Um, um, obviously, I, I, I'm Irish myself. Um, what are you seeing, you know, when we think about the European market, I know you've been very busy in the uh, active in, in the European market. Um, if we use our, Ireland as a case study for, for, for the moment, what are you seeing um, from a medical standpoint uh, and from a hemp standpoint in Ireland? 
Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the government's basically legislated, uh, you know, medical cannabis. We've seen uh, a few imports come in, uh, you know, on the, on the flip side, we've seen CBD being available, uh, you know, through mainstream channels, just like it has been in, in the UK. And I would, uh, you know, I, I don't often like to compare and I'm cautious of comparing Ireland with the UK. But uh, nonetheless, I think that, you know, it's, it's very similar in terms of both from a challenge perspective, as well as from an opportunity perspective, where on the one hand, you've got CBD products that are already mainstream and they're everywhere. And now the Food Safety Authority, uh, even in Ireland, is looking very closely at novel foods and understanding how novel foods will apply to this. And for those that don't know what novel foods is, uh, it basically uh, is legislation around something that is newer in terms of food products. Uh, and, and there's a legislated way, and CBD falls within that, there's a legislated way to actually launching ingestible uh, CBD products uh, into mainstream society, including at retail, as long as you can satisfy, uh, you know, toxicology and basic uh, uh, kind of, you know, safety standards uh, in terms of CBD being a food. So it's very cool to see CBD go down that path, particularly for me uh, from a Canadian context, where Patrick, even today in Canada, like CBD and THC are the same. There's no regulatory difference. So you can get, you know, 10 milligrams of THC uh, just as easily or arguably as difficult as you can on 10 milligrams of CBD, uh, even though we both know it's vastly different. So when I look at it from a Canadian perspective, you can't go to a, you can't go to a, a Nordstrom as an example and pick up a CBD skin cream, uh, whereas it's cool that in Ireland you can. Uh, on the flip side, when it relates to medical cannabis, I think what's happening in the UK is, is also happening in Ireland where, uh, you know, you've got, you've got challenges. The government's allowed importation, but you have physicians you know that haven't really embraced this fully and aren't able to prescribe as much and so that's you know it's a challenge people often say you know well imports uh, you, you know don't seem to have picked up as much uh the key thing for most people to understand is uh you know germany is a market that has opened up significantly and there's a lot of imports that are actually happening in germany and so i think if the government which in ireland is now starting to open up and relax uh, importation it's no longer just a name patient product you can actually store and warehouse uh, you know a slight amount of quantity within your license uh in ireland so i, I feel like you know imports will pick up and will come on but you really need to get physicians educated uh, and have them prescribing because in absence of that it's going to be very challenging to build out a medical framework so those are two sides uh patrick just from uh, both medical cannabis and a cbd aspect on what's happening in ireland yeah for sure and you mentioned germany there i believe there's about eighty thousand registered medical patients uh, in germany at the moment i think there's about a thousand maybe in the uk uh, so it's the, again, and I, I believe there's a handful in Ireland that are uh, registered, um, you know, medical cannabis patients. So it's it's still very very early days, and and you know while while Canada and the U.S. is quite quite obviously quite advanced and and pioneering the way in many ways, particularly Canada, um, we, we in many ways we have a long way to go in Ireland, um, and you know there's a lot of challenges obviously too with with um, misunderstanding of or particularly at a political level about what cannabis is so that's part and parcel of what we're as a collective as i mentioned is trying to really educate those at all various different levels um from political level down to understanding the value of this not only from a health and wellness standpoint but from an economic standpoint um you know if we look at the numbers it's it's the 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 tax revenue that can be generated from 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 medical and recreational cannabis is is significant for for many many um, uh, countries around the world. So it, it's a super interesting area. Um, for for if we flip back over to Canada for the moment, what are some of the the, the next steps for Canada? It's, I mean, it's been it's been a pioneer, obviously. Um, and uh, but what are some of the next steps to continue that sort of the, that momentum and that pioneering for the country? Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, you know, there, there's still a lot that needs to happen here uh, on the uh, on the adult use, so the recreational side, as an example. Uh, there's still a number of provinces that need to have stores opened up. As an example, Ontario, uh, you know, just crossed over 100 stores. And I mean, it's our largest population base uh, in terms of the country, as well as number of stores. They could easily be over 500 stores at this point, and there are a number of applications in the process. The government's finally understood that there needs to be more stores being uh, becoming available. So I think in a province like Ontario, there needs to be a lot that happens in terms of more stores coming on board because that is going to 
directly speak to access. Uh, I think there's other provinces, as an example, in, in Alberta uh, already have 500 stores for a relatively smaller province. But really, I think at retail, we need to see more stores being opened up. There needs to be a little bit lesser uh, bureaucracy across the country in terms of uh, opening up of more stores. And I think you will see that happen in the next year. Uh, I think on the other side, uh, the, the growers or the cultivators need to start to you know uh, get very smart about the quality of products that they're actually growing within a regulated uh, environment. I think one of the biggest complaints that you hear often from people that are consuming cannabis and have been for a very long time with the legal market uh, have really been two things. It's been price and quality. And I think you're now starting to see growers for whether it be because they have too much inventory and they don't have a very high quality product, but certainly we've seen prices come down, uh, which is a great sign generally for, for everyone. And the regulator specifically loves to see that from a government perspective. Uh, but I think it hand in hand goes quality. And so we want to see uh, a better quality product being produced. And I think uh, we're now starting to see a wave of craft cannabis uh, producers come online uh, and they're actually, you know, able to uh, compete both on price as well as quality. And so, you know, I, I certainly see that movement kind of picking up steam. Uh, but those are the two big things that need to really happen. Uh, I think the third thing is medical cannabis. There's still very much that needs to happen on the medical cannabis side in Canada. Uh, we haven't gotten pharmacies, uh, you know, still being able to carry this product as it needs to be. Uh, you look at a country like Germany and, you know, whilst it's, it's debatable in terms of number of patients, but, uh, you know, we know that the market is, is definitely there and it's quickly building. And that's one of the reasons why is because it's in mainstream pharmacies. You can actually go to a pharmacy, speak to a pharmacy, pharmacist and actually get your, your medical cannabis. So I think even post legalization, I think that's one of the things that seems to have been lost in Canada a little bit is that medical access part is that research part. There's not enough happening. And I feel like there's much more of that that can, that still needs to happen. Yeah, that's a fascinating area. I mean, the, the R and D is, um, and again, we're only on the tip of the iceberg of what the capabilities of the various different cannabinoids can, can have on, on, on our health and our wellness. We, we had a Kurt Robbins on, on our last show and he really took a deep dive into the, all the various dhcvs and cbn and cbg yeah. and those amazing amazing cannabinoids that nobody really is talking about yet but we hope to start really just bring those to, into the into the public domain as uh, again as replacements as uh, other options for the uh, folks that are you know have serious illness or are in pain management or that you want to you know create a more healthy uh, healthier lifestyles and given the COVID situation obviously building our immune system is, is critical to be able to um you know build up our, our health and our wellness um one thing that you know one of the big stories from the last week was was the um was was with aurora obviously in canada for those that don't know that they aurora is one of the largest lps licensed producers in the world um and they let go of about 700 uh employees could you Tell us a little bit more about what, what was going on with Aurora, because I think it's a great example of, of LPs, Canadian LPs, sort of retracting from their, their sort of global vision of, of vertical inter vertically integrated globally. Um, tell us a little bit more about your understanding of what's been happening at, at Aurora. Yeah, I mean, and just to kind of level set a little bit, I think for most people to understand, uh, you know, the way that the government rolled out this program only, you know, five or six years ago was uh, you you were required to be vertically integrated. So it's not like companies chose to become vertically integrated. You needed to do everything from seed to sale. Uh, right. So you need to basically get your genetics, you need to harvest them, you need to learn very quickly how to cultivate a product, and then you need to do everything from packaging, labeling, all the way up until patient education, physician education, and kind of sending them the product. And it, so you needed to be Oh, you know, have become overnight essentially a vertically integrated business amongst a whole bunch of regulatory uncertainty, first on the medical cannabis side and then on the on the recreational side. So, uh, you know, that's a bit of history and background where a lot of these companies are coming from. It's often very easy to kind of, you know, uh, point fingers and blame people. But in hindsight, when you step back and look at this, I mean, yes, a lot of these changes actually need to happen, but and, and uh, they're finally happening. But there was a reason why these companies were, were vertically integrated. And now a lot of them are realizing perhaps Perhaps they don't need to be. And so Aurora is really has been one of the last from the bigger companies uh, that have had to shut facilities recently and, and just did last week and unfortunately lay off a number of staff. Uh, Canopy Growth and Tilray and some others, uh, you know, did it much earlier. Uh, but, but yesterday, uh, sorry, so last week, uh, you know, Aurora sort of has now seemed to have taken this big approach and basically 
cut a significant amount of their staff and shut a number of facilities uh, just to be able to understand what the long-term vision is and where they're going. And that includes, as you said, Patrick, the global side of things, which is, uh, you know, repatriating from some countries where it might not have made sense for them to have set up these massive operations or could could have been serviced from either one jurisdiction in the Aurora's case, it's Nordic, uh, uh, in the Nordics in Denmark or, uh, or, or Canada, as an example, to be able to service that global demand. Uh, but we've seen a, a, a change in, in philosophy and a, a sense of realization in terms of where they want to go. Uh, I still think, uh, you know, people that are looking at, at va validating companies and business models need to look at one thing, and that's cash in the present environment and seeing how much cash is actually on hand, because that's going to be the single most determining factor that goes into the longevity of businesses and what happens. Uh, and, and I think it applies to Aurora as, as much as it applies to any of the other uh, bigger or smaller companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super interesting. Um, and I think that's it goes into the the, the conversation that's beginning to emerge uh, as we, uh, you know, grow into this industry is around managing risk and risk mitigation. Um, there's a lot of stories and there's a lot of articles and there's a lot of uh, noise beginning to um, evolve over the, the, the concept and, and the topic of risk mitigation and risk management. And I think, you know, building sustainability into into the core of, of a company is really helping to you know mitigate risk. Uh, so we're seeing more and more companies do that, um, uh, you know, to manage risk. What's your, wh where are you seeing some of the sort of the key areas of risk in, in Canada and globally for the, for the industry? Uh, Patrick, you know, still it, it, it comes down to growing a quality product. I think there's still risk in that. And it's, it's surprising in many cases that we're still talking about this, but, but yeah. cultivating a, a compliant product still seems to be challenging for some companies. And that's a, a pretty big warning sign. I mean, if you haven't figured out how to cultivate and grow cannabis in a compliant setting uh, in several years, you know, that's that's one of the big challenges is just uh, is, is that side of things. I think the other thing, the big one is quality It's just being able to produce a quality product at scale uh, is becoming more and more important now. And we're seeing the market kind of uh, push back on that and saying, yeah, it's great that you've got a, a cheap product. I mean, there's a certain demographic that uh, skews towards, uh, you know, the, the pricing aspect of things, but there's a big subsection that looks at quality product. And so I'd say those are the two big things that are, uh, you know, currently uh, a lot of companies are struggling with. And that's what consumers, quite frankly, are, are holding companies to. Yeah. As you think about about you know Canada has had a sort of a, a, a first mover advantage in many ways, and some of the big challenges for Canada, Canada is the cost of production versus the cost of, of production in countries like like Colombia, for example, and and Lesotho in, in south, close to South Africa. Um, how are you seeing these these emerging um, industries and uh, emerging countries like like Colombia? Um, threatening the the sort of the position that canada had because it's it's it's, it's you know low cost manufacturing of high quality uh, products um well colombia has the opportunity to to become that it's still very very early days but how are you seeing these these emerging countries challenge the um the position that canada has, has had and will have yeah, so I mean, you know, one of the good things that Canada did very early on, and I think what really helped us was the federal prohibition in the US. You have some very sophisticated MSOs and multi state operators that, uh, you know, have phenomenal operations, and all the things that I talked about as being challenges uh, in the Canadian market are actually addressed down south to, to a great extent. Uh, and so I think what's helped us to a great extent has been the federal prohibition in the US, or in other terms, the legalization at a federal level in Canada, which has allowed us to do two things. One is generate a lot of money and be able to kind of grow uh, through that process. And the other is export cannabis products, right? We've been able to, to ship cannabis across borders, which has really helped us. So, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. I look at places like Colombia and Lesotho and Macedonia as being jurisdictions that still have some work to do in terms of regulatory compliance, but there's no question in my mind uh, that we will be seeing the, you know, cannabis as a commodity coming out from those jurisdictions. And, and absolutely, there's going to be the, uh, the recreational kind of prohibition because of UN treaties where you can export recreational cannabis from places like Uruguay or Colombia into, uh, let's just say, Canada or Germany or the US as an example. But we, we are seeing and we will see more of this uh, in terms of medical cannabis moving out of these countries and, you know, uh, 
uh, both Uruguay and Colombia, as an example, uh, have had some very sophisticated and sizable shipments now that have actually left the country for export purposes. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. I think what Canada is going to be known for in many ways is the is the IP in many ways, uh, not not IP specific as much to the plant, but more in terms of people, uh, capital, and to a certain extent, brands. Uh, you know, and as much as there's been prohibition on brands in Canada, you're still, because you've managed to export uh, a ton of product to places like Australia and, and Europe, as an example, people now know who Canopy is. People now know who Aurora is. And the only reason is because there's been a lot of product that's actually gone from Canada to pharmacies in Germany, to uh, pharmacies in Australia, as an example. And so people in those countries are now starting to see those brands. I think the US, no doubt, and there's no question that has some very sophisticated brands, but they haven't actually managed to export those brands in the same way that Canadian companies have, have had to. So uh, I completely agree with you. I, I don't see Canada being a mass cultivator of cannabis on a global scale, uh, you know, even for medical purposes in the near term. And, uh, you know, that's certainly an approach that we're taking. I certainly see places that have been historically cultivators, growers uh, of many products, uh, including food products that, uh, you know, are all cultivated in Canada. As an example, we import all of our majority of our food from places like, uh, like Mexico and Colombia. So this is no different. And that's certainly the path that it's going to go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting, and we're seeing a lot of well, we're seeing more and more of the the particularly the California brands really beginning to look at the European market. Um, mostly, obviously, CBD brands at the moment, of course, and and they're looking to, you know, these are drink brands, these are drinks, these are these are gummies, these are food brands, and they're really looking to move into the European market. We're seeing a lot of movement behind the scenes on, on on sort of jostling position to get into certain countries of course um which is a very interesting thing in itself uh we have a we have a question from edgar in in germany and he wants to know a little bit more about when will we start to see cbd uh, pet products and, and 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 cannabis based pet products uh in the market and I, he didn't specify which market but i think we could use any market for for that example Got it. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, look, it, it would be good to know the market that, that, that the question was asked about. But well, he's based in Germany. So, I, I, I think we okay, so European or a German perspective, uh, yeah. you know, I think there's already CBD products in the market there and pay very close attention to novel foods. Right. Uh, and just going back a little bit in terms of the U.S. brands, I think that U.S. brands certainly see a massive opportunity in in Europe. Uh, but if you're looking at ingestible products, I think if you're talking about vapes or any topical products and whether it be around, uh, you know, uh, the veterinary market or uh, or the human market, I think it's it's equally the same. You could, there's no reason why you can have a cosmetic product in the market immediately. Right. And we know that uh, for things like, uh, you know, uh, the, the tear marks that dogs have an ex as an example or anxiety that cats have, there are some topical applications that you can actually have on CBD. There's no reason why you can have those in the market immediately. But in terms of ingestible products, in terms of dog food or pet food, as an example, more generally, I think you want to pay very close attention again to novel foods in terms of the CBD side of things. Uh, because if you're going to have anything that's ingestible, uh, if you're a U.S. brand, pay very, very close attention to novel food. Do not get caught off guard uh, because the, the enforcement is coming, right? And I think uh, American companies know this better than anybody else in terms of what the heavy hand of enforcement looks like. And whilst Europe is never as as heavy handed as the FDA would be in many cases, uh, it's still there. And, and so, you know, don't get into a market uh, just because there's that opportunity there. Understand what the regulatory requirements are going to be, not just today, but actually in a year from today, when those, when the, when the FSA, which is the food safety authorities in various jurisdictions across Europe start to really enforce ingestible CBD products. So I think, uh, you know, there's no reason why you wouldn't see veterinary animal health type products in the market, uh, particularly on CBD fairly soon. As it relates to medical cannabis, I still think we have some time and some work to do on uh, on veterinary medicine in Europe on, on the THC side. For sure. Um, another uh, question that's come in, Laura from the UK, what are some of the, the uh, CBD drinks that she should be looking out for, some of the healthier uh, CBD drinks? And she probably was referring to the UK market, but um, I, I, I think she's referring to some brands there. Any type of brands that she we should be looking out for? 
Well, I think, you know, I've, I've looked very closely uh, at the CBD beverage market in, in sort of Europe more generally, and there really isn't anything as sophisticated right now. We're not talking about nano falsification. We're not talking about all of the different aspects that we have in, in Canada and even more so in the U.S. in terms of the way that some of these people have gone about, you know, looking at CBD beverages. Uh, specifically, you look at Canopy Growth as an example, uh, despite the Constellation backing, which is a significant beverage player, uh, has had a number of challenges launching a beverage product in the Canadian market. And it's not because of a regulatory uh, perspective, it's because they haven't actually gotten the, you know, the product mix right, because THC typically sticks to the aluminum cans as an example. So, uh, you know, personally, I don't think there's any sophisticated brand on the market yet. I think there will be. I think there will be North American brands that actually start to enter Europe from a, a beverage perspective. And those would be the ones to watch out for. I, I wouldn't personally uh, recommend any of the brands currently on the market in, uh, in Europe, uh, particularly from beverage perspective. And Interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I think one of the, the the key brands over here in the states, anyway, is a is is a is a CBD beverage called Killcliff, um, and Killcliff originally started out as a a, a normal beverage uh, company, but they moved into the CBD uh, realm, and I think they're now one of the leading um, leading brands. In fact, we're going to have Killcliff uh, come on and tell us their story about the how you know the the origin of the brand and and how CBD has uh, changed the direction of the company. Um, so they're definitely one of the leading brands over here. Um, you know, Lagunitas uh, is another brand that we have over here. And I say over here, we're talking about California and, and, and the States, which is um, uh, a Heineken owned uh, a brand. They acquired Lagunitas about a year or two ago. And Lagunitas, for those that don't know, is a non-alcoholic beer with THC infused in it. So. It gets you the high without getting the without getting drunk and without the hangover. So um, that's been doing very very well over here. I I don't believe it's in Europe yet. It's still um, it's it's still very early days on that front. So um, have you have you heard of Lagunitas that, that brand? Yeah, I have. I've uh, I've been following, watching that fairly closely, and and I agree, it's definitely a brand that uh, uh, you know would at, at some point enter Europe. I think you need to figure out the novel food criteria, even if it's going to be for CBD. Uh, but but yes, I'm familiar with that brand. I would add. Um, Valens, which is a company that I sit on the board of, has a you know a, a really cool product in the market. It's called Basecamp. Uh, it's launched across across the country, and uh, you know they have an agreement with a company called Source Technologies. And Source basically has a you know a proprietary formulation of nano emulsification, and uh, you know some phenomenal products that they're launching on the beverage side. So they'd definitely be one to watch for, um, you know, in, in the coming future as well. Yeah, and we've one 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 final question, and then we can wrap up wrap this up. Um, it's from it's from uh, Peter in in Ireland actually. Um, he's asking about when do we should we expect the the conference the uh, circuit to start moving forward again, or does he th do you think that it'll be you know virtually based? Obviously, we had Prohibition Partners Live last week, um, which you participated on, of course. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's difficult to say. I think uh, when the the conferences in person will start, but um, MJ Biz being the big one in December in Vegas. Um, what's your thoughts on that? And it, I think it's a great question by Peter, by the way. Yeah, I can't wait uh, personally for the conference circuits to start. I mean, Zoom and everything is great, but uh, you know, there's that human element that you almost need. Um, uh, I think probably December is, is when we'll really see things heating up. And I mean, already we've seen Europe open up to Canada as an example. Uh, just yesterday, they said that, you know, they were establishing air bridges now between countries. And so you're actually, you could travel from Canada to, to Europe. Uh, I think the U.S. is still still banned in terms of countries letting American citizens in. But I think by December, uh, assuming we don't have a huge second wave of COVID coming up, uh, I think that would be a, a timeline that you can expect. I think MJ Biz in Vegas in, in December is probably going to be, is, is currently scheduled. And I think if things keep the way they are, then you'll see uh, that be a massive uh, event again. Uh, but but I'm not expecting anything to happen in a sizable way until November, December. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's hope. let's keep the fingers crossed. Well, who knows what it'll be like? I mean, I think they had 30 or 40,000 in, in, in MJ Biz last, last year in Vegas. I don't know how they're going to do it this year, but we hope if we keep the fingers crossed that we can because this industry is about people. It's about connecting. It's about you know really meeting each other. Vir virtually is great, but it doesn't. You can't be meeting in person, and that's what this industry has been built on: is, is people and connection. Um, and uh, so let's 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 hope we can we can all be there in in Vegas in December. 
and elsewhere at all the other circuits, of course, the other conferences. Deepak, I want to really appreciate your time. I want to thank you so much for joining the, the Cannabis Review Show. You're, you're a wealth of knowledge. And um, is there anything, any um, uh, any way that, that the reader, the, the listeners can follow you on LinkedIn or on Twitter, on Instagram, or any any um, anywhere they can follow you? Yeah, Twitter is probably the most active for me uh, at uh, Deepak Anand. Uh, you could uh, follow me on there. Deepak Anand at Materia Ventures too. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Excellent. Great stuff. Well, thanks very much. And hopefully you'll come back on again in, uh, in a few months and we'll have some good updates and we'll have moved the industry forward despite all the challenges we're having. Very thanks happy so. to hopefully meet in person soon. Great stuff. Take care and stay safe out there. Okay, thanks Deepak. Well, let's see. That's another end of the uh, the, the Cannabis Review Show. I just want to thank you so much for tuning in. And we want to thank our sponsors once again, uh, Edibles Era, who do the wonderful Bliss Balls in Dublin in the Punnett Health Stores. So uh, get in and get them. They're, they're CBD uh, Bliss Balls, and they're super, super healthy and super delicious, of course. So we want to thank you again for tuning in. Um, you can follow me uh, on LinkedIn, Patrick McCartan. And you can follow at Regenibus at Irish, Irish Media Network. And we've got some great topics coming up and great guests coming up over the next few weeks. So feel free to join, join us and tune in. And we look forward to, uh, to talking to you then. Take care. Irish Media Network. We entertain.